Okay, so recording started. Welcome to everybody. This is a new uh, webinar from the International Legium Society. I'm very happy to be here with uh, Professor Pei Tzu from uh, China Jingyang University. Today we are going to talk about uh, phenomics in general and functional phenotyping. Functional phenotyping and its link uh, to into physiology. As always, I remind you that uh, we are recording the webinar. It's going on our YouTube channel. So if you don't want to be recorded, uh, turn your camera off and uh, we'll have um, the presentation. And at the end, there will be room for questions. So please, uh, Professor. OK. <clears throat> Can you see the slide? Yes. OK. Okay, first of all, thank you very much, Nelson, for uh, providing me with this opportunity and for introducing me. Uh, it's my privilege and honor to be able to present some of our recent work in the phenomics uh, for the lagoon crops. So first of all, let me uh, introduce myself and my lab. My name is Pei Su. I'm currently a professor and the dean of the College of Life Sciences at the China Jiliang University, uh, based in Hangzhou, China. Now, Hangzhou is located to the southern east part of China, very close to Shanghai. So I'm currently also the vice chair of the vegetable lagoon section of the Chinese Society for Horticultural Sciences. And I also very much honored to be elected as the academic committee member of the International Lagoon Society last year. Um, my research focused very much on the vegetable lagoons, in particular their quality and the safety traits uh, using the approaches of genomics and the phenomics. Uh, shown here is a special issue for the uh, official journal of the Lagoon Society, Lagoon Perspective. Uh, the issue name is Lagoon Crops in China. This is a joint effort between uh, me and uh, many of my Chinese uh, colleagues under the encouragement of Dr. Rubiel, uh, Diego Rubielers. So I thank him for providing this opportunity to introducing um, some uh, recent advances in uh, or status, recent status of lagoon crops breeding in China. So now I'm going to talk. Sorry, about sorry, to, sorry to interrupt you. All the numbers, uh, all the issues of uh, Legum Perspective are for free available on our website, mm -hmm. legumsociety.org. And uh, this, um, this, this issue, Legum Crops in China, is uh, from June 21, I guess. Uh, uh, yes. yes, June yes. 21. Okay, yeah, yeah. so if uh, any of you is, is interested, it's available for free on our website. Please, sorry for the interruption. Please go on. No problem, no problem. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about um, water relations and drought tolerance. So as we all know, um, improving drought tolerance is a big challenge uh, facing the globe. Around 70% of the global fresh water consumption is due to the agricultural section. And what is surprising is the proportion of water absorbed by crop roots from the soil and lost through the leaf via transpiration can be as high as 99%. So current, uh, nowadays, many areas of the world is facing severe drought risks. So it is important to understand plant water relations, or PWR. The PWR concerns how plants control the hydration of their cells. We all know that plants collect water from the soil, then the water transports within the plant. There are several parameters, like the leaf relative water contents to reflect the water status in a plant. The water finally will, will lose by uh, evaporation from the leaves. And there are also some parameters like transpiration rate, stomata conductance, etc., to reflect 
these traits. We also know that the stomata is the gateway of both water outflux and the CO2 influx. So there is always a trade-off between the water in and the CO2, uh, sorry, between the water out and the CO2 in. So there is an extremely important parameter turned water use efficiency, WE, to, uh, to reflect the, this trade-off. And the WUE is important for striking a balance between yield and the drought tolerance of a plant. There are already many, many studies focusing on water relations and drought tolerance. But still, plant water relations are considered one of the most traits to phenotype because the complexity of the soil properties, the rapidly changing atmosphere status, and the interaction of drought with other stress factors. So it is even difficult to define what a drought resistant plant is. For example, in the study of um, model crops, like model plants like Arabidopsis, so we usually use the survival rate to measure the drought resistance level of a plant. But this definitely will not work for crops such as tomatoes, because we not only want to see the survival of the plant, but also less yield loss of the plant. So in, in this sense, it is important to highlight a concept called agronomic drought resistance or ADR. So ADR reflects the capacity of enhancing drought resistance without re sacrificing crop yield. There are already many, many genes cloned so to be shown to uh, correlate with a uh, drought response, but only a limited number of genes can really be used in agriculture. And those genes that conferring agronomic drought resistance are potential breeding target genes for striking a yield survival balance. Recently, last year, we uh, published a review article in the journal Plant Breeding to summarize such a potential breeding target genes for ADR. So if you are interested, you can refer to that. Besides, the emerging phenomics technology can play a critical role in identifying ADR traits. So now, so let me introduce the phenomics concept and the tools. Phenomics is the omics of phenotyping. As we all know, there are different types of phenomic approaches, like from the morphology-based level, using uh, cameras or spectrum or even satellites or drones. And also there are biochemistry-based phenomic approaches using uh, some instruments like uh, a GS. And here today, my topic will be focused on the physiology based phenotyping using um, high throughput uh, physiological phenotyping systems. We coined a new term called physiolomics, which means the omics of physiology in uh, 2021. So here is the platform we use we always use for the physiological phenotyping called plant array. So this is uh, already commercially available system from Israel. So this picture shows the developer Professor Men Menachem Moshlein and me uh, in Hebrew University of Jerusalem in Israel back to two, uh, 2010. So since then, we collaborated for many years dedicated to uh, developing new algorithms for the use of this system in uh, many different types of crops, uh, in particular in particular lagoon crops. So this system is basically a weighing lysimeter array. It allows high throughput, non-destructive, continuous and simultaneous phenotyping of plant physiology. The parameters that the system can acquire 
include plant weight, transpiration rate, stomatal conductance. So these are basic, some basic or primary traits. Also, the system can derive some advanced secondary traits, such as the critical soil water content and the slope of transpiration declining. So here, the critical soil water content is an indicator of the stomatal sensitivity to soil water depletion. So I'm going to um, explain more later. So here, I'm going to give you the first story using the um, plant area system, system to better, to deeper understand the plant water relations. It is about discovering and leveraging golden hour WE traits. So let me um, explain more. So today my topic is, is a little bit professional in terms of the plant physiology. So we know there are disparities between the regulatory patterns of photosynthesis and the transpiration during the day. As shown in this figure, the, uh, the value of the WE uh, expressed as the ratio of photosynthesis to water use. It, it displays um, a pattern like this. We can clearly see that during the early morning, when the light intensity is sufficient, but the vapor pressure deficit, also known as VPD, is low a high WE is achieved. This is because the plants can attain higher photosynthetic intensity with lower transpiration in this early morning environment. So this leads to a more efficient biomass production in a water saving manner. So, so we are uh, called this specific uh, WE window as a golden WE and the hour during the early morning is called as the golden hour for WE. We proposed a new physiological trait, golden hour WE, abbreviated as a GHW, which is typically expressed after sunrise in the morning and we anticipated that genotypes with superior GHW traits, for example, showing higher WUE and a higher photosynthesis rate concomitantly for a longer duration of the day will be required. So for using it in agriculture, we need to be able to measure it and quantify it. So this slide I show how we measure and quantify the genotypic difference in GHW. We use the plant rate system to measure the real-time canopy, stomatal conductance, transpiration rate, and the biomass gain of the plants. And we use simulation models to estimate water use efficiency by leveraging the acquired transpiration data and the environmental parameter data, like the solar intensity, temperature, uh, moisture level, etc. Here is the formula for estimating WE. So I'm not going to give um, many details here for this um, simulation model because it is pretty much professional. Uh, but I want you to understand that. So by doing so, we were able to dissect the GHW traits into several quantitative components. So for example, peak value, which shows uh, the highest value of the WE during the day, the peak timing, so which indicate when the highest WE appears, and the accumulated um, TR to VPD ratio during the golden hours as a function of the WE. So they are very important. And we also define a parameter called FGHW, which represents the contribution of the accumulated WE during the golden hours throughout a day or the daily 
accumulative WE. So after establishing the method, we performed functional physiological phenotyping for 24 common bean genotypes. Showing on the left are the environmental parameters or and the plant parameters, including photo attraction rate, soil water moisture levels, uh, solar solar uh, intensity levels. And in this table, we summarize the calculated uh, quantitative components for the 24 common bean genotypes. But clearly, we see the genotypic variations for these um, golden WE traits. And uh, correlation analysis showed a strong correlation between the daily WE and the accumulative WE during only the golden hour time window instead of the uh, instead of the rest of the day. So, so this validated that the early morning golden hour window is critical for uh, achieving uh, biologically or and the uh, agronomically meaningful WE during the whole day. From the 24 genotypes, we also were able to identify several superior and several inferior lines. And we are currently doing some molecular characterization for these lines to try to understand the underlying molecular mechanisms, why they show differential golden hour WE traits. So based on the aforema uh, aforementioned studies, we propose a practical procedure for leveraging golden hour W traits in breeding. So basically, it uh, comprises three steps. The first step, we're going to do large scale physiological phenotyping of a population. The second, we're going to genotype the measured plants in the lines. And then, by combining the genotypes and the phenotypes data, so we can develop molecular markers and utilize them in molecular breeding. Uh, the majority of the data I just uh, talked about has been uh, recently published in, uh, in the Chinese journal, uh, Chinese-based international journal, Veg Vegetable Research, is a um, sister journal of uh, horticultural research. OK, now we move on to the second story. So here I'm going to talk about a joint physiological functional molecular approach to understand the mechanisms behind the water conservation versus water profligation traits in two different lagoon species. The one is cowpea. Cowpea originated from West Africa and is considered as a water conservative crop. Another is soybean originating from East Asia. Compared to a cowpea, it is more water profligate, which means it uses more water during drought. The platform is the same, the plant array facility based in uh, Huayan, China. The, however, um, comparing physiological traits between different species or even between different uh, cultivars of the same species is very challenging because the uh, the speed of water loss among different pots can be very different so which means the soil water stress level among different units or different pots are very unhomogenized so first of all we need to establish a method to solve this problem so that we can precisely uh, reveal the mechanism of the differential leaf responses to the similar level of drought stresses. So here, leveraging the feedback irrigation function of plant array, so we were able to precisely control the uh, soil water content in each pot of the system so that we compare the water uh, the water relations in leaves of each plant 
under the same or the, under the similar level of root stress scenarios. The entire experiment uh, is divided into four stages, namely um, well watered, mild drought, severe drought, and recovery. Through so using the system, we acquired transpiration rate data normalized to VPD and plant weight. This is to indicate water use behavior of a plant. As you can see here, the system continuously and simultaneously monitor the water relations of the plants. We discovered a greater WE in cowpea than in soybean under well watered conditions. So this is consistent with uh, earlier publications using traditional like manual measurements as well. However, the continuous monitoring enabled us to find uh, something new, so which is a more conservative water use. Ah, sorry. Uh, so let, sorry. So so let me uh, let me uh, uh, correct what I just said. So here, a more conservative water use in cowpea under earlier drought stages, as well. So under well watered and earlier drought stages, more conservative water use as indicated by lower normalized TR was observed in cowpea. So this is consistent with earlier reports using a uh, manual measurement. So, but the system allowed us to find something new, which is a higher normalized transpiration under prolonged drought as shown here. So which means under severe drought, cowpea becomes the more water profligate guy. So only by using a continuous real-time uh, monitoring, so can we easily find this uh, interesting phenomenon. So showing here is the, um, how we can uh, well control the uh, soil water content for each um, pot. We collected the plant tissues for molecular anal analysis based on the uh, soil water content instead of based on the treatment day. So the later is usually is frequently used in many uh, drought research, but it is not a precise way in comparison to uh, our approach. We also were able to find a soybean only interesting phenomena which is a significant phase advancement of the middle day transpiration. As you can see here, five days after drought, the daily maximum transpiration rate appeared earlier, several one or two hours earlier. And it becomes even more apparent, evident on, uh, on the seventh day. And upon recovery, Water recovery or water resumption, so the um, phase advancement diminish. So next, we wanted to um, understand this physiological phenomenon through a gene regulatory uh, aspect. As I just mentioned, we collected the leaf leaf samples based on soil water contents. We collected the samples three time points a day at early morning, at noon, and at the afternoon, respectively. RNA sequencing analysis revealed that around 16% and 20% of the unique cowpea and soybean genes were differentially expressed. Very interestingly, we found out the time of day had an impact on both crops and showed complex interactions with drought scenario. For example, as you can see here, under the mild drought condition in the early morning, there was only a very, very small percentage of the cowpea genes were differentially expressed. But at noon, much more cowpea genes became differently expressed. 
So TOD or time of day really matters. Here showing, uh, here shows the uh, top DEGs between the two species, which means the D differentially expressed genes that showed the highest fold change upon stress. Here, as you can see in Cowpea, the top D DEGs include uh, aquaporin gene and ABA signaling gene, PP2C, but in soybean, there are several flower genes, so which are known to associate with the uh, cell wall among the list of the top DGs. Gene ontology enrichment analysis in the two crops shows that the photosynthesis and the stress responses were not enriched in cowpea under mild drought, but the goal enrichment patterns became more similar between two species under the severe job. So this highlights a dehydration avoidance mechanism in cowpea under MD as we, uh, as we discovered through physiological analysis. Since TOD was found to be important, so here we examined the differential expression of the circadian clock genes in their response to uh, drought stress. We identified all of the circadian clock genes from cowpea and soybean respectively and performed RTQ-PCR analysis. We found out indeed several genes um, like the REV, REV gene that shows very different regulatory patterns between the two species uh, in response to uh, both drought and also uh, time of day. We, we conducted a uh, gene co-expression analysis to, and identified two modules from each of the two crops as significantly associated with the transpiration rate trait. So this, 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 and this. There are the modules related to the transpiration rate. Very interestingly, we found that one module from Cowpea M17 shows negative correlation with the soybean M14 uh, module. And this is considered to be related to the very, very different or sometimes um, reversely correlated physiological behaviors of the two crops in response to drought. We identified hub genes in those transpiration associated mod modules. From these hub genes, several genes, uh, several genes drew our potential uh, a, a particular attention. For example, this gene, CYP gene, is an ABA degrading, encoding an ABA degrading enzyme. So, so let us look at the expression pattern of this gene in the two species. Very interestingly, you can you can see that under the well water conditions, its expression in cowpea is very high, but under mild drought, its expression became lower than that in uh, soybean. So this expression pattern is very it, it is perfectly match the physiological observations. So we assume that the higher expression uh, of of this gene, uh, sorry, the lower expression of this gene under the mild drought conditions, that would result in um, a lower level of ABA degrading enzyme, so that the level of ABA, the hormone ABA, can increase. In the in the soybean uh, in the cow in the cowpea, sorry. So because of the higher level of ABA in the cowpea leaves, so it it becomes more conservative in terms of water use. So the uh, the higher long, uh, higher level of ABA so would uh, would cause uh, some more tightly controlled stomata, so that it it is more water conservative in terms of water use behavior. So lastly, to provide some functional evidence um, that, that supports the uh, important role of these hub genes in regulating transpiration rate, so we used a transient 
overexpression assay in Calpi. This is because uh, stable trans uh, stable trans transformation protocol uh, has has not been readily established. So we use the transient overexpression assay. We cloned uh, the VUTPS gene as a, as the hub gene and transiently overexpress it in Calpi. Then we treated the Calpi plants with uh, PEG to mimic different strains of osmotic stress. As we can see here, the transpiration rate and the stomach conductance was more sensitive in the TPS9 overexpression lines than in the CK lines. As you can see here, the stomata were closed uh, to uh, were, were, were more close than those in the CK, so to prevent the uh, excessive loss of water. Verifying that VUTPS uh, is important in the conferring the uh, more water conservative role in Calpi. Based on the aforementioned results, we were able to draw um, a primary um, skin for the mechanisms of the profit gate versus conservative water use strategy in vacuum crops. This basically includes uh, the interplay among crop type, job scenario, and the time of day underlies water conservative versus profit gate traits. Several genes, including the, the top DG, DGs like the TIP gene, the aquaporin gene, the FLA gene, and also some hub genes like the TPS9 and the ABA degrading gene, they are highly interesting candidate responsible genes. Several biological pathways like photosynthesis, redox, homeostasis, cellular stretches, uh, epigenic regulation, and water permeability adjustment are highly interesting processes, pathways. So now finally, really finally, I want to show um, a coupled phenogeno-functional approach for deeply understanding uh, plant water relations. So this approach basically comprises um, high throughput phenotyping of the plants uh, equipped with feedback control to enable efficient generation of the plant and the environmental trade data. This will also enable precise sampling of the plant tissues for a more pointed molecular or cellular analysis. This approach also highlights the combination of the modeling methodology to better understand the primary traits. By using mathematical models or process-based models, the primary trace data can be derived into more complex um, advanced physiological data. And then combining the uh, physiological data and the genotypic data, we will be able to determine the dynamic QTLs, which means quantitative trait loci, or even genes underlying the uh, complex plant trait. By using multi-omics and functional tools, we can finally validate those QTLs or the causal genes. So this, um, this is an unpublished material currently under review. Okay, so lastly, I wish to thank all the people I worked with. Uh, this includes Professor Menahem Moshlein, my good friend and a longtime collaborator from Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Uh, Professor Rong Ling Wu and Dr. Li Bo Jiang from Penn State University and Beijing Forestry University. We worked together in developing um, some uh, genetic algorithm and some young people from the Huayan Academy of Agricultural Sciences who uh, assisted a lot in uh, uh, plant array experiments. I also wish to take this time to uh, thank Professor Diego Rubielers who introduced me to know and join uh, the International Lagoon Society. So my work uh, are funded by different agencies like the National Science Foundation of China and also the Central Government of China and the Ministry of, of Agriculture of China and also um, 
some companies who are who are interested in jointly developing some uh, either uh, hardware or the software. Thank you very much, and uh, uh, I would be very happy to take your questions. Thank you, Professor. It was a very interesting presentation. Now it's time for a question. If anybody want to ask, if you don't want to talk, you can actually use the chat and I would read your question for you. Okay. So let me see if, let me break the ice so people are not shy to ask. Um, Oh no, is is there somebody asking? Okay, yes, there's Carlotta. Hi Carlotta, uh, please uh, please talk. Hello Nelson, good morning. Uh, good morning, Pashu. Thank you so much for this uh, presentation. I hope you can listen to me well. Um, I, I had um, uh, just a, a curiosity on, on your plant um, array facility that you showed us for the first approach of your talk. Uh, I was curious to know if you use it, what was the, well, uh, first of all, what was the, the maximum capacity of this plant facility? And if you use it for um, uh, genome-wide association studies with this uh, golden hour, uh, WUE? Mm -hmm. That was the question. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much, Kalota. So I think we uh, we communicated several times by email, but this is the first, really the first time. So we we emailed, uh, we emailed. This is an excellent question. Um, so in terms of the capacity, it really depends on uh, how many units you already have in your um, like a, in your university, um, like a. Uh, in our case, we have 100 units set up in our experimental staging. But in, uh, as far as I know, in Wagalinga uh, University in Netherlands, they purchased 50 hundred units. And also in the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, they have um, 50 hundred. So it, it actually, you know, it depends on how rich you are. <laughs> so you can you can buy as many as you wish, if you have sufficient uh, grounds. But uh, I would also uh, want to say um, this is one of the um, major drawbacks of this system, because compared to some other high throughput system, the cost is relatively high. So I, uh, I, I, I didn't take this opportunity to show some other um, phenotyping systems, like we have one, one uh, novel one developed in, in my own lab, it's um it's uh, like a, a variable nano variable sensing system so which is uh, much uh, cheaper so i wish to be able to give another presentation next time so when our system becomes like a, a commercially available but this is a really good question uh using the uh, current 100 units we have already tried some trial uh, studies for GWAS. And the results ha has already been published. Uh, so the, the 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 biggest problem is uh, for any physiological phenotyping, we need to include many replicates. So for these 100 units, usually only a 20 or 30 genotypes can be uh, phenotyped simultaneously with uh, three to five replicates. So the batch effects need to be addressed if um, like hundreds of genotypes need to be phenotyped for a common human analysis. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Carlotta, for your question. Is there anybody else? Um, okay, so I have a uh, more uh, specific question. I'm um, I was curious about uh, the golden hour um, uh, GHW, uh, the the golden hour 
water use efficiency parameter and uh, I was uh, wondering uh, how much of the total water use is expressed during the water, uh, the golden hour. So uh, I, if you have an idea about uh, how, how much of the total of whatever happens during the day happens. Yes, just I see in your point. Period. I see your point. This is also a very good question. Uh, it depends on the genotype, but according to our data, uh, it this ratio, uh, this percentage, can be up to 90 percent. So, which means for some specific genotype, the uh, the accumulative WE during only the golden hour of the day can be the vast majority of the total daily uh, W. That's why you know we wanted to uh, to look for some uh, a superior W E. Uh, golden W trait plants, so that we can fully use their uh, property for uh, photosynthesis. Then during the non-golden hour, we can reduce the uh, irrigation mm -hmm. because this will not affect the total uh, yield much. So this is the idea. And do you think that uh, this could be, well, it seems that it has uh, very practical effects and uh, it could become also an indication for growers or for farmers at the end for sorry uh, it, it seems that it's it's very important and it can have a very practical implications yeah so we can yes, uh, yes. at the end you can also uh, advise the growers the farmers on how to adjust their mm. the watering mm -hmm. of the fields yes yes Okay. Anybody else? Okay. So I guess that your presentation was uh, pretty clear, and um, also I would like uh, well I would like to to thank you again. Uh, if you could uh, share with me later the papers that you linked okay. uh, i will put them also on our contact so thank again thank again professor too and uh, as always uh, thank you for everybody that was present here for this uh, this webinar and see you all uh, next month thank you Nelson, and thank you all for listening sure. see you thank next you. time bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye.